from the Kingdom Games Studio, live from Steven's personal art studio inside the studio, sort of an inception studio. Uh, I am Chris, your humble community servant. Live from Steven's New personal York Kingdom art Games, studio inside and also studio. Texas Kingdom Games ATX, and all sort your favorite social media sites. Studio. Steven, uh, how are you? I am Chris, your humble community servant. I'm excellent, Chris. Steven's how are you doing? New York Kingdom awesome. ATX, and all your favorite social media sites. It's a great day. It's sunshining. Steven, how are you? It's almost summer. I'm excellent, Chris. How are you? I'm really excited to be here. As Chris said, I'm Steven Donnelly, art director for Kingdom Games. And I'm happy to say, over the last six months of streaming, six months. Or June the second, I'm coming to you live from my office because I have a Cintiq. I want to thank Kingdom Games for hooking me up with the Cintiq, so I can actually draw in the studio. And it has been an incredibly productive two weeks. I can actually draw in the studio. So, do we want to talk about anything? Productive two weeks. What's public? Should we can share? So there is a project that's being worked on. It has exciting new art elements in it. So there is a project seen on previous concept shows. It has exciting new art elements in it. That's all we're ready to share so far. All right. But within the month, we should have concept shows. More information than that. Yes. And it's very exciting. All right. So I look forward to being able to share it with you. So does Chris. More information. Uh, all right, let's just do some art. So this we're doing. What are we doing this week? Character art? Uh, actually, all right. Let's just do some art. Question from the community. So this we're doing. What are we doing this week? Character art? Uh, actually, all right. Let's just do some art. So what we're going to do today is take one of the concepts created by the amazing Manuel Gomez and so what we're going to do is stylized version of that concept. All right, so, so when you say stylized, we're talking things like cell shading, um, other things like that. So would Dark Void be an example of a stylized game? Cell shading, Pixar, it's a great example of stylized. Borderlands, Borderlands is a great example. Overwatch, Overwatch, yes, and Overwatch is a great example. Borderlands, Borderlands is a great example. And for some reason, I decided to watch. Let's do a character. That's a good idea. It's going to be great. <laughs> okay. So, Goliath in style. Right. I'm actually going to switch this over to the desktop. Okay. Boom. So, there we go. Okay, so what we're looking at is a concept from Manuel Gomez. Uh, are okay, so what concept we're artists for is five concept Guardians of David, and uh, this yeah. is a piece Our that he so did concept for Goliath. For and this went through Guardians a lot of iterations, of and, and this is, is the final concept. Did what I want to show you, Goliath. So this went through a lot of iterations. Let's see. Nine foot tall. I believe that's. I believe that's what says. Yep. And a guy proportionately. Now, Goliath is a big, aggressive fellow. And so when we think about big and aggressive, there are some aggressive animals that come to mind that are roughly humanoid in shape. And I'm going to go with a gorilla. A gorilla. However, gorillas aren't aggressive. But their shape psychology lends itself to being aggressive. They have longer forearms, shorter legs, but they're big, strong, just hulking lens itself. So to be somewhere between that picture of Goliath and this gorilla, shorter legs, um, they're big, strong, going to create our style. So somewhere between that picture of Goliath and what I'm going to do is just go with a simple solid brush to start. So somewhere between that picture of Goliath and what I'm going to do is just go with a simple solid brush to start. No, he's a giant, so he should probably be bigger. Uh, so you're giving him a relatively small head. No, he's a giant, huge torso. Boy, this is nothing like the machine I have at home. It's actually really being taxed. Torso. 
Put in some shoulders here. Machine. I have it on essentially some delts. I want that head kind of hanging down lower. Put in some shoulders here. Machine. I have it on essentially some delts. Just like that. I want that head kind of hanging down lower. Center line in there. Delts like that, head kind of hanging down. His chest, starting his trunk. Now, thinking about that gorilla, I want to keep this trunk, his chest, relatively small. Now, thinking about that gorilla, legs, I want to keep this trunk, his chest, relatively small. Now, thinking about that gorilla, legs, I want to keep this trunk. Relatively slight. We'll make a meaty. Thinking about that gorilla. Legs. Keep this trunk. Relatively slight. We'll make a meaty. Give him some short legs like a gorilla. Give him some short legs like a gorilla. And uh, I'm going to Control T to transform. Right click on warp. I'm going to widen up his shoulders and his body. Into control T to transform. A little too much in the head, but I'm going to widen up his shoulders and his body. Into control T to transform. It's pretty too much in the head, but I can widen up his shoulders and his body. control T to transform. It's pretty too much in the head. Right now, it looks like I'm just, uh, what am I saying it looks like? I'm actually just roughing it in. Right now, show you where it looks like I'm just, uh, what am I saying it looks like? I'm actually just roughing it. Let's see. Got it. Right it's here. It looks like I'm just, uh, give him some big biceps, but like a gorilla. Let's see. And I don't know if it's actual or not, but a gorilla's. Some big forearms biceps, look really like large, gorilla, and I'm not sure if it's because of the fur. I don't or know if they have it's actual or not. oversized forearms, forearms look really like large, and I'm not sure if it's because of the fur. I don't know. They're pretty large. Look at the biological lines of Apollo. I don't know if they have actual oversized forearms. Look really like a gorilla. I'm not sure if it's because of the fur. I don't know. They're pretty large. Look at the biological lines of Apollo. Look at them. Um, very large forearms, especially the males. Vegetarians, though. And actually, yeah, like I said, not very aggressive, territorial. Um, but arms, not usually vegetarians though, um, and actually especially not the male. I said not very aggressive, males, territorial. Um, but um, it could be wrong on that one. I'd have to double check. Vegetarians though, um, and actually especially not the males. So it's not very big arms. Um, but at this point, it's still a pretty humanoid shape. You could take the right. same rough and make and a realistic drawing, couldn't you? Oh yeah. But this We've already got a real estate. So, but, but from stylization, it doesn't take place necessarily at this oh, yeah. stage. This is at the sketch stage. Is it, is it already kind of? So, yes, but, but from stylization, it doesn't take place necessarily at this stage. This is. Um, at the sketch I stage, is it already kind of? I take the so, but, but from stylization, it doesn't take place in the sketch stage. At the sketch stage, is it already kind of? So, but from stylization, it doesn't take place in the sketch stage. I take the version. So 
what we have here is a very realistic proportion human beings, mm -hmm. and then so make them a little bigger. What we have here is a very realistic so that's about proportion human the beings. same size, mm -hmm. and then you can see so the proportions of the stylization that we're going for here. So that's about proportion human the same size. Oh, yeah, when you put it like that, you can definitely see like the the huge grill arms there, right. even even kind of the hunched overness a little bit. Yep. And I'm glad you asked like because it's like, like all of this, like this creation there. process, even is second even nature to me. Overness a little and bit. I lose sight and of I'm the glad fact that it's like, like, like all of this, people like this, like this creation to process, to do art or are that art savvy. And I'm glad you asked because it's like all of this, people like this creation process, to do art or are that art savvy. And I'm glad you asked for those in our community. And here it becomes very obvious. He's got huge forearms. So those in our community, here it becomes very obvious. He's got huge forearms. Those in our community, here it becomes very obvious. He's got huge forearms. Now Goliath gorilla is that just a coincidental little uh, little uh, assonance there? Well, it's more um, no, Goliath, shape psychology. So when you think of a, like a big, well, powerful, uh, giant well, it's of more, a man, um, um, no, shape psychology. So you think of like a big, powerful, like, hey, that guy, that giant, guy's like a gorilla. More, man. That guy's um, totally jacked. No, shape psychology. So you think of that. like a big, on the opposite end, you might say, giraffe like that guy's totally jacked. Yes. I see that. On the opposite end, you might say a guy, giraffe like that, totally jacked. Yes. I see that. On the opposite end, you might say a guy, giraffe like that. Got that. Let me turn this guy back on. So he's got a kilt or some kind of skirt, and then a. Got that. Let me turn this back. Breeze. So he's got a kilt and shoulder pad. So thinking along those lines, and actually I'm going to switch brushes here, and I'm just going to go to my standard brush. Thinking along those lines, and actually I'm going to switch brushes here, and I'm just going to go to my standard brush. Need some sandals here. Trying to switch brushes here. with the light. And, uh, giving that suit the light. Hey, you kind of get that caveman vibe already. Yeah. Hey, you kind of get that caveman vibe already. Yeah. Now with a silhouette, like what are your what are your go tos for a silhouette? Like I know uh, Matt Groening's big thing was always hair. Like Homer Simpson's hair, Marge Simpson's hair. They have these like now really stylized like, haircuts. You could always tell hair just silhouette. by the silhouette, like, know, the shape uh, of their hair. Like, what are your go tos to make a silhouette really recognizable? Uh, for me, it starts with just the form. What are your go tos to make a silhouette really recognizable? And that's one of the beauties. For me, it starts with stylization. Is that Everything becomes so much easier. That's one of the easier identifiable stylization. Is that everything becomes so much easier. That's one of the easier identifiable stylization. And the click in you here is me uh, changing the size of the brush. Identifiable stylization. And the click in you here is me uh, changing the size of the So what's an influence for this type of art? Would it be surrealism? Like what? Is it hyperreal? Oh, it wouldn't be hyperrealism. No. That's a really good question. So what's an um, influence for this type of art? Would it be surrealism? Like what? 
I would hyper say, real, would be hyper real and yeah. I'm not an expert. That's a really good question. So what's um, in this type of art? Like what? As you will see. Hyper real, say, um, hyper real and I'm not an expert. That's a really good question. It's called in this type of art score. As you will see. Style of art um, score. Um, I'm not an expert. Um, so I would think that it originally started with caricature work, um, making um, fun of people, so silly I would faces, think that, it that sort of started with caricature the Roman times, they found graffiti of people. Uh, yeah, Nero. And, uh, and from that, that point, in the 1700s, once we started printing, yeah, Nero. And, uh, not just in the form of painting, but illustrating to tell stories, uh, characters become much more stylized. So if you think about uh, stories, Dickens, characters become much more stylized. Artists. So if you think about uh, stories, I'm not sure, but you know, people are very skinny, the noise noses are long and mm -hmm. pointed, you've got the long, thin body with the long top hat. Yeah. yeah. That sort of thing. Very skinny and um, noses are long. How, and certainly with the advent of film yeah. and that's animation, uh, stylizing animals, and people, certainly with the just advent of film from there. Yeah. That's animation. And they all use, you know, simple shapes I call it. People want to stick with that. And that's uh, yeah. they all smooth, use simple, rounded shapes, shapes are peaceful. Blocky and shapes uh, are dependable. And then sharp, pointed shapes are rounded shapes are peaceful. So this guy, dependable. we want a big and blocky, but we definitely want to get some sharp shapes on him. So this guy, I got a close on the big and blocky, but we definitely OBS want is a memory hog, I will warn you. Yeah. Okay, so we've got to keep so this guy. Shapes. What else can we close? Big and blocky, but we definitely OBS is a memory hog, I will warn you. I'll pause this, that should help too. Uh, yeah, right here, bottom left. Pause that. Okay. And that should help too. All right. Oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to watch live? No. Well, it's on a two second, it's on a delay anyway. Right. Okay, so I got some on my screen there. Um, so now that I've got like the simple shape locked in, one of the things I want to do is darken it up because just working with dark from light is important. And then I want to come through here. And again, I'm going to go to my standard brush that I like so much and just. Uh, carve him out a bit. Like I want a hint of the tricep in there, maybe the uh, the elbow, certainly the, the huge forearms, big hands coming down. Now a lot of people don't know but when I joined the team on five Guardians of David there was a desire to create the game in a stylistic fashion. Something that would appeal to a younger audience. And ultimately, we moved away from that for time and production considerations. Stylization takes way longer, right? It does, because everything has to be created from hand. So, like, if when Goliath is realistic, or all your characters are human proportions, it's really just a matter of, okay, well, I know what a person looks like, or I can get a picture of a person, and then I can start uh, doing the concept from that. But when it's stylized, everything has to be stylized so it all has to be concepted and it can be expensive in that fashion and then you also have the issue that you need the production team everyone on the same page with that level of stylization 
I know, for me personally, one of the games I really enjoy is Borderlands from Gearbox Software. And Borderlands has a wonderful stylization. And for me personally, it's very reminiscent of Heavy Metal Magazine, which I grew up reading as a kid and was an inspiration to me to become an artist. When you look at Borderlands, like even the rocks, right? I mean, even just rock textures have to be these new ideas. Like they're. Correct. It's not just a gray rock, it has to be the right element of like cross shading and outlining and and does all that have to go through concept too just having mm -hmm. someone be like oh they have to look this is what a yes. rock looks like in stylization yes now once you get into production you start building all this stuff it goes a lot quicker I'm going to give them a skinnier waist simply because the more you repeat something uh, the faster you get at doing it That's our, I'm not super crazy about the way that torso is working, so I'm going to make him even darker, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see that on the camera, but there is a subtle level of uh, information in there visually that I can see. I mean, just looking at the proportion of the, of the, the head to the hand proportion, like his fists are just... Massive. Massive, yes. yeah. And I assume that stylization, that's part of it too, is like an actual axe is, you know, probably weighs what, five pounds, ten pounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If. And, this, and these guys are going to carry what, 300 pound <laughs> massive battle axes or hammers or whatever that are just insane to carry. Exactly. That's it, exactly. One of the things I'm going to do is, uh, it's talking about shape psychology, triangles, is I'm going to start indicating in his uh, leather, I don't know, skirt, kilt, whatever we want to call it, start getting some points in there. We'll get a little, just a little sharp edge there. And visually, that's just signals to people that sharp, dangerous, yes. pointy, Yes. Malevolent. Bad guy. And then when you take into the other things, like the elements of size, that all points out that when you look at the silhouettes, like this is not a, this is a foe, not a friend. Right. This guy is big and intimidating and dangerous, and he's not going to be smiling. Or if he is, it's going to be a pretty malevolent smile. So are there elements of like, Curves, like I think of like like an Aphrodite statue or something. If you took the silhouette of it, like the curves of that are very, you know, pleasant to look at in terms of like there's not aggression there. Even in like the 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 skirt or the the toga around her is also very smooth around the edges, even though it's crumpled. It doesn't have those the sharp edges versus something like I mean, even an angel statue. I think a great example where they take kind of the the edges of feathers. I actually do look kind of sharp, but the way they smooth them out to be more rounded at the tips. Right. And then, you know, demons have bat wings, which have sharp little points on it, on them, that kind of thing. Mm hmm yes. That's exactly it. I'm learning. We're having a great discussion about stylization. I know you said Brothers Tale of Two Sons was the initial inspiration for the art style, and then it shifted to more of a, a realism style? It, it did, and um, I don't think we can actually say that Brothers was the inspiration, but that was the stylistic direction okay. that the team had wanted to go. So that was counter to like the original directive was very much hey we want to create something that is historically based and it needs to look historical and so in that exploring of the stylization that's where we went okay so that's a little hard to see but what's going on is I'm just going to grab this here 
and now I'm going to start flushing it out. Remember, forearm muscles come over like that. And actually, we're going to have something right down the center there. And even though he's armored, I'm starting with a. Uh, I want to get the anatomy underneath working so that I understand it properly. And then that way, once I start putting armor on him, he will, uh, all the armor will make sense in the right spots. Get a nice big thumb here. Nice finger coming out. Is that right? You can really see the muscles coming in now. Yeah. Just the veins popping. Just yeah. Monstrosity. Goliath! So how would David be stylized if Goliath is like gorilla inspired? What what is a like a like a a 14, David 16 year old boy? Would, I would say eight year old boy. Eight year old? <laughs> yes. David would be stylized to be this uh Teeny little kid. <laughs> what animals are reminiscent of children? Um, children are kind of their own animal. Yeah, exactly. There's a parental joke in there. Ha, ha, ha. Um, no, I can see him being inspired by like uh, puppies, you know? Yeah. Big head, really tiny arms. And what I need to be doing is looking at some uh, facial reference, but I'm just going to quickly block that in, and hopefully it won't look too bad, though it does look kind of bad, and now I'm all freaked out. But don't sweat that. And we'll get his chest here. Big, monstrous chest. Talking about the ancient world and in creating five, five set around 800 BC, 800 to 1000 BC, does that sound right? 1000 BC, yeah, yeah, that's so about right. Yeah. 2800 to 3000 years ago, um, which was the dawn of the Iron Age. And what I thought was really interesting is in the news in the last couple of days, they have assayed. King Tut's dagger that was found in his tomb. And King Tut's dagger was forged from a meteor. Its composition is iron and cobalt. And it was around 1350 BC. So about 23, 2400 years ago, the Egyptians were... Uh, had the capability to forge metal, and not just metal, cobalt. What's special about cobalt? Cobalt has a fire assay temperature that's extremely high. It's like 1,500, 2,500. It's a crazy number. And they use cobalt in strategic, it's a strategic metal. They use it in like jet engines and that sort of thing. So, I suspect that in the years to come, there's going to be a lot of discussion and reworking of 
the history books because if the Egyptians had the capability to smelt and forge iron and cobalt some 23 to 2400 years ago, that's going to throw the Iron Age, dawn of the Iron Age, off mm. a bit. Very pure iron nickel alloy, traces of cobalt. Uh, iron meteorites recovered in the Egyptian locality of Karga. The nearest source of precious metal at that time. And of course, all of the ancient alien theory people are rejoicing. Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, Why are they <laughs> rejoicing? Oh, uh, there's a lot of theories that Egyptians, aliens, there's a lot of... Dude, what was that movie? Uh, Stargate. Yeah, Stargate, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that kind of stuff, exactly. Yeah, wasn't uh, that good, but I love the concept. It was really long. Uh, 13th century BC, um, they actually f were able to forge this uh, more than uh, two millennium. Uh, so about 2,000 years before anyone else could do it, the Egyptians were smelting and working with cobalt traces. <laughs> Iron from the sky, as the Egyptians called it. That's awesome. Or as Amp.com's calling it, King Tut's dagger came from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically that's true, but I think the way they're saying it, they're trying to... Uh, yeah, it's a little bit more else. salacious. Yeah, yeah, I think that's implying a little bit more than what it was. Yes. Yeah, but we're talking about the same time frame, so if that's the case, I think that'll give you a little more artistic freedom to do some pretty cool stuff. Heck yeah. Space Goliath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, giants came from another world. Isn't that a theory or something? There's a lot the of The Illuminati? Theories. No, the Anunnaki. Anunnaki. Is that what it is? Thank you. Anunnaki. Look that up. Hey, if you're watching today, or if you're watching later on, we're going to have an uh, interesting discussion. So once I get a simple silhouette roughed in, one of the things I'm going to do is use my dodge tool for the midtowns, and I'm going to highlight the upper part of Goliath, and that is to show that the upper part of him is getting a lot more light than the lower part. Maybe hit the forearms a little bit, and then certainly the feet. His waist, and honestly, I kind of want to give him a little bit of a gut. Well, he is stylized. The Anunnaki, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> that's talking about <laughs> Nephilim and stuff, so that's a... Right. Um, okay, so I have a few things here where my proportions are all a little bit off from my rough-in. And oh my gosh, I'm not sure where I want to go with this. Okay, I do know the first thing I want to do is shrink up his head. So I'm just going to use my marquee, surround it, and then give him a smaller head, which is uh, kind of makes him look a little bit silly. He's, he doesn't have room for a neck. Right, he's so big he doesn't need a neck. This guy's a linebacker. And uh, now what am I doing with the shoulders? Okay, so at a certain point as you're working, you're kind of like, uh, I'm getting a little confused. So what I'm going to do is create a separate layer. And then I'm going to start creating my perspective line. So that's where I want his shoulders. If his shoulders are there, that's about where I want the top of his bicep. And if that's where the top of his bicep is, that's where I want the bottom of the bicep. If that's where the bottom of the bicep is, this is where I want the wrist. And then as I get down here to the ankles, there we go. And then we'll do one more with the top of his head. It's like, okay, so now I've got some guidelines and I can see how he's a little wonky. So I'm going to go in here 
and I'm going to fix that wonkiness. So I'm going to take his head and put it up here. And then I'm also going to rotate it a bit. And then I'm going to warp it a bit, give him a little longer face there. Is this based on fists for dividing a body, or is it just these are just perspective lines? Heads. Oh, okay. So, so how many heads equals a body? Uh, I think it's six. There we go. So that puts that in the right spot, and then these biceps actually got to bring the stuff down to about like that and uh, I'm gonna bring this hand down quite a bit so it's a little more I want to rotate it a bit. Yes. And then his left leg. Left foot's a little forward, so we'll bring it down a bit. And then we're going to warp it to uh, make it a little bigger. Hey, so do we have anyone with us today in our community chat? No, it's a, it's a slow day today. All right. Yeah, no luck. No Amber. None of the usuals. No Mike Maddens. No anybody else. It's all good. Yeah, so n now we can... Heck, let's have our discussion about the Anunnaki and... Uh... I'll give you one. It's not giants, but there's a theory that trolls were actually Homo erectus. Oh, really? For me, it was Neanderthals. Might have been Neanderthals. Uh, that there was a time, period in time when there was a coexistence between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Correct. And Homo sapiens developed language, um, you know, other communication methods, and they kind of got a lot away from this ferality that uh, Neanderthals suffered from, or suffered from, or experienced. That's how they lived. They were they were more animalistic. So. I bet that's going to change in the future, and we find out that it's humans that are. Oh, uh, it doesn't. It would not surprise me. Neanderthals <laughs> were like the most intelligent race, and they were just beaten to death by guys that look like this. Pretty much. That slowly but surely uh, yeah. just whittled down. Looking at humanity uh, today, it's pretty obvious uh, we don't treat each other or the things around us very well all the time. Oh, definitely not. Not saying that we can't. We certainly have that capacity. We just don't do it all the time. <sighs> yeah, if we. Uh, you never appreciate something until it's gone, right? Yeah. Um, All right. But Neanderthals, uh, there's a theory that the idea of a troll under a bridge mm -hmm. was actually the last remaining Neanderthals. Oh, now and I'm sad. They were just kind of wiped out animals. Yeah, they were wiped out, and they were just kind of the remaining ones for these scary kind of creatures that would like go where there were natural structure, where there were uh, not natural structures, but constructed structures like for instance a bridge or uh, some other place where they could habitate like a cave yeah. and the idea of the troll under the bridge is you know essentially Neanderthals that would possibly attack people or scare people I don't know about giants though but it would not surprise me if giants there was some similar effect to them well if you think about it so my understanding, and again, man, I'm not a historian, I don't know for sure. And the Lord knows what you read on the internet, you need to take It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> it's all of it. All of it. Um, but uh, if you think that ancient man tended to run about four to five foot. Right, pretty teams, short. Yeah. Right. And then occasionally you get the six foot person or... Occasionally, you, you get, get the, the eight outlier. foot person. You get the outlier, right? right? It's like so to a four, foot, a four person, foot four foot person. A six foot person looks like a nine foot person to right. a four foot person. Yeah, it's a substantial variance. It is. So as translations go forward, people, you know, like 
like, huh, well, that, and we embellish, and... Also, no one was measuring. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, it was not like there was someone who was actually measuring these things until probably, you know... Now, uh, now what I thought was interesting is, um, I learned something about Rome, is to be a legionnaire, your minimum height had to be 5'10". That's 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. So imagine if everyone's averaging four to five foot, and then to be a soldier in the Legion, you had to be a minimum of 5'10". It's literally every giant person is going to be a Legionnaire. I feel like that's a myth, though, because why would the Romans measure in uh, English units? Unless 5'10 is two meters or something. I don't know. But didn't, even meters, uh, like why, they, they probably didn't even have meters at that point. No, they didn't, but uh, didn't they use inches back then? No way. I don't know. Let's look it up. When was the inch, the foot, the mile invented? Who created it? Go to the internets, Chris. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm going to find out, first of all, if you're acting on this Roman Legion, your height. Okay. It was a recruiting poster I saw. It's actually 5'5". Five, 5'5"? Five. Five, five? Yeah. Okay. And it is centimeters, which makes more sense. Oh, here we go. Uh, average height 155 centimeters for women 168 for men and their skeletal structure of Roman skeletons um, especially by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius which gives you a lot of skeletons yeah it does actually that's a good point you were correct actually legions had to be 510 wow the Marian reforms required the just to be 510. Without the height requirements, from what I read, the average barbarian was like 2 to 3 inch taller than a Roman soldier, so the barbarians were super tall. Six foot. Easy. So, um, a few years back, I went and visited Sicily and spent uh, almost two weeks there. Had a great time. Want to immigrate. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I got a kick out of is I flew through Germany. And so Sicilians tend to average around five foot, five two, just generally. Wow. And so tend to be smaller. Germans, everyone tends to be six foot, easy, men and women. And thinking about uh, the barbarians at the gate, what it must have been like to just have an army of giants assaulting the city, <laughs> and how intimidating that would be. Yeah, that's not not something I want to deal with. Yeah. Me neither, man. All right. Measurement systems started 4,000... 4th and 3rd millennia B.C., so we're talking like 4,000 B.C. first measurement systems. Right. Babylonians um, measured by length of the forearm, hand, and fingers. But we don't know how big they were. Yeah, they called the Egyptian cubit. Uh, the Donis bow, the crosa crow or cocal, the jana stage. The cubit was the length of a forearm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, divided into the span of the hand or the length of the tip of the little finger, tip of the thumb. Romans did use feet. Wow, you're right. The Romans did use feet and inches. Go figure. Who invented it? Was it the Greeks? Was it Romans? Was it? It was someone who said, "Okay, every different country or kingdom uses a unit of measurement." based on whoever their leader is. Right. And someone said, this is stupid, let's standardize it. The royal cubit was a standard cubit enhanced by an extra palm, thus seven palms of 28 digits. The inch, foot, and yard evolved from these units are a complicated transformation not fully yet understood. Yeah. Some believe they evolved from cubics, otherwise they were simple proportions. The Greeks and the Romans inherited the foot from the Egyptians. The Roman foot, which is 296 millimeters, was divided into 12 inches that were about 25 millimeters and 16 digits. They also introduced a thousand paces or double steps. That would be five Roman feet. Romans had a mile of 5,000 feet. Uh, and that was used for a long time in New York. 
Go figure. Oh, I yeah. would think the, the, the base 10 system would have been first, but that's actually really interesting. Well, the base 10 system is actually from measuring a planet, like the circumference of the Earth, or half the circumference, broken down is like, what, 100,000 kilometers, 10,000 kilometers? Sounds about right. I think it's right. 26,000 miles, right. 76,000 miles. That's where the metric system comes from, is that it actually uses the Earth itself as a standardization. Which that is came along in the 16 to 1700s. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Actually, can you look up something? It's always been sure. a curiosity to me, and we're talking about these things. So, back in 12, 1300, New Year's fell on the spring equinox or around Easter. And then at some point, we turned it to January 1. Can you find out why? 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 Chris, I want to know why. Uh, why the New Year starts on January 1st? A terrible time for renewal from the Washington Post. This is just an editorial. Mm -hmm. Many religious and cultural communities also observe their own calendars. January 1st emerged from the Romans. Shocker. Uh, 153 BC, um, they changed to January 1st. Uh, there's religious significance. January is the festival of Janus, the god of gates and beginnings. Um, so, okay, when the Romans used the lunar calendar, the year began in March. Mm -hmm. But they be. added some months. Did they? <laughs> they added months to the calendar. Uh -huh. So that's when it changed to January. So yeah, I guess it used to be the spring solstice, technically. Well, and that just makes sense to me. It's like, okay, hey, in the beginnings, halfway between the summer and winter equinox. Well, well, in literature, winter always means death, and spring means life. Right. So, naturally, the evolution of, I mean, it is the, it is the, the year is a metaphor for life, is it not? So there's birth, and then there's the summer, which is growth, and then fall is the decay and winter is death. So the seasons are metaphors. So to start with death, or halfway through death, it's just sort of peculiar. It is. Okay, so there we go. That is a mean looking Goliath. <laughs> Me too. He's he got a broken not, wrist, so we're going to fix this. He does not want to mess around. <laughs> Let me turn. Okay, turn that on. Yeah, okay, that'll work. So again, those perspective lines come in really handy. Don't mess with Goliath! I can just... Uh, just the... This is the Goliath that does not wear a shirt. He just <laughs> yells. He wears this weird loincloth skirt thing and just... There's something about the way his waist and torso is working, and I wonder if maybe it just needs to be... Something a little more, a little more like that. I don't know, I'm trying to so come down here, come down here. He's got a belly button here. Even a great beast like this was born from a mother. Yes. Hopefully, mom was big. She's probably a giant. 
I know uh, before my son was born, uh, he was a couple of weeks late, and we had gone in for the, hey, what's going on with the baby? And uh, they came back with saying, yeah, he really needs to come out. He's somewhere between 10 and 13 pounds. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> and Cindy lost her mind. <laughs> She's like, get this baby out uh, now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was a 10-pound baby. Were you? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So legacy continues. A uh, guy I used to work with, actually, is the lead animator on, is it Paragon coming from Epic? Yeah, Paragon, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, Charles, I believe Charles was a ten-pound baby. Oh my! And Charles is six-eight. Well, at least he has an excuse for it. Yeah. That's amazing. The predictions you can make based on baby weight. Like, what, what's gonna be? He birthed the giant Stephen. Oh no, he only he was eight pounds. <laughs> oh, they just, they measured wrong. Oh, I didn't finish the story, did I? No. Uh, no, the measuring is inaccurate, to say the least. And uh, when he was born, he was born uh, like 7 pounds and 15 ounces. Yeah, well, I just... It's, it's okay, a pretty so large discrepancy. I'm going to... I'm going to need some reference before I start drawing that face. But... That's a nice block in, and as you can see, we got some serious stylization from realistic Goliath to, hey, stylized Goliath. Um, so now, I want to start doing a little armor on this guy, getting a sense of what he's got. And if I remember, in the Bible, it describes Goliath, like he had a helmet of iron and a lance of iron, and he wore iron, that sort of thing. And the Philistines were a seafaring people, or they lived along the coast. So I want to do something that has... A, uh, a C motif, but it needs to be kind of scary. Mm. Now, what is reminiscent of C from a silhouette perspective? Um, certainly a, a fish. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Huh? So, uh, the fish in the ocean, uh, Are fish that scary? No, fish aren't scary. There's a swordfish. There's deep sea creatures. Barracudas and stuff. Yeah. Eels, snakes, that kind of thing. Yes. Okay, so that gives us... That gives us some shape, and that gives us some stylization. Okay. Yeah, he's got a cool armband there. And uh, let's give him some shoulder stuff. And because it is stylized, I want to use these big blocky shapes. Let's see what I've got going there. So. So normally, when I think about water, I want to do something like that. But like corals and stuff. Yeah, but that's a very friendly kind of shape. Actually, I'm going to keep that thing there. Um, how about a shark? God, that's so cliche. <laughs> that's something about stylization, too, is that stylization, for a lot of it, can be very cliche. Yeah. Um, Lion. Lion heads and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we could do a shark, but that's so obvious. What else is in the sea that's scary? That has ribs. Uh, what's that fish with the saw? Nose. Swordfish? Swordfish. Is that it? It's got like the sawtooth nose.
Oh my, there's some scary fish on here. Yeah, Sharp teeth. What about alligators and crocodiles? It's that region of the world. Totally evil eyes. Ridiculous teeth and evil eyes. All I'm seeing for scary fish. <laughs> very, very sharp teeth and very scary looking eyes. Right. It's all that deep sea stuff, right? You know, those like pinhole eyes and. Anglerfish type stuff. Yeah. Oh, octopus. That's a good one, too. Oh, he could look kind of Cthulhu, couldn't he? Mm. His squid legs are real creepy. My Google skills are impeccable. So we'll do something like that, and then we'll do... Philistines Coastal? Mm -hmm. The thought is that they actually uh, they came from the Aegean when a volcano exploded. Seeing a lot of stuff here about the regional habitation. Let's see. Southwestern. Tel Casil, modern Tel Aviv, was a big port city for them. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Ziklag. Uh, that territory is debated. Location of Gath is not entirely certain, although Tel Es Safi, not far from Ekron. I was going to say, haven't they already found Gath? It is or favored that it's Tel Es Safi. Okay. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but they have theories. Yeah, this is it. This is Gath. Philistines were conjectured sea peoples who repeatedly attacked Egypt. During the 19th dynasty, they were repulsed by Ramses III. He resettled them. They rebuilt coastal towns in Canaan. A lot here about sea people. Mm -hmm. Southern sea people. Breastplates, short kilts. Chariot, horses, small shields, straight swords, and spears. The more you know. I know. Watching this program is like watching G.I. Joe. <laughs> the Ironborn Sea Peoples. Yes. From the Iron Islands. Oh, yes. yes. 
Wow, that's a sick gauntlet. Okay. And then we just need a little white for the highlights. Like, woo! Metal! Okay. <laughs> so let's go back and recap. This is Goliath from Five Guardians of David, created by Manuel Gomez. When we look at just the silhouette, you can see that it is a very accurate, proportioned human silhouette. We talk about stylization um, using a gorilla as influence with those longer arms, shorter legs, created our silhouette, uh, used just a quick faked perspective guide to make sure that we get the anatomy in the right spot, so the shoulders are lining up, the eyes will line up, the mouth, the forearms, the hands, make it all work. Uh, the feet, this right foot's coming forward, and then a piece of armor made of iron with, with a sea theme and some spikes because he is, uh, he's not a nice guy. I dig it. He's a bully. Right. So. Okay. Yeah! <laughs> uh, with that, this is another week from the Canary Games Studio. Next week we'll be back with the design team showing off some surprises, I believe. Finally. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can follow Steven and all the other great stuff he does on our YouTube channel. That's Kingdom Games ATX on YouTube, as is all of our other social media. We have some cool speed-ups that we're actually going to be releasing over the next week, too, which will show some previous shows to see, hey, well, here's an hour in 60 seconds. So lots of Steven's artwork is up on the YouTube channel, as well as Twitter and Instagram and all those other great places. So that's Kingdom Games ATX, Kingdom Games Austin, Texas. And of course, the game is Five Guardians of David, available now on Steam, Amazon, Greenman Gaming, and our website, kingdomgames.com. So Steven, uh, so last comment, uh, what's your spirit animal? If you were going to stylize yourself, what are you going to use? Bunny rabbit. Brilliant. Have a great week. We will see you next week. Bye. Stop. Just, I could do it. Can you? Yes. <laughs>